women who get together with other women are healthier, happier, and stronger. Now we can make some figure eights with our hips. Figure eight, figure eight, figure eight, figure eight. By the time I met Mickey, I had already contemplated suicide and I was developing a plan. That's how dark my life had gotten. Because I'm a woman, phenomenally, phenomenal woman, that's me. Hi there and welcome to Prime Time for Women TV, the show for and about women in their prime. On Prime Time for Women, we thrive on celebrating women, especially those who have incredibly inspiring stories. It's not every day that I get to welcome a biracial farmer, a successful entrepreneur, a renowned author, and a community activist all at one time to our show. In the state of Maryland, where only 2.5% of the farmers are black, black and 12% are women, it's my pleasure to welcome Natasha Bowens Blair to today's program. Natasha is living out her passion on the farm she co-owns in Boonesboro, Maryland. She's the mother of two little girls, wife to a fifth grade teacher in Frederick County and co-owner and operator of Native Mountain Farm, a place where fruit, medicinal herbs, and flowers grow wild. She's also an author and has spent the past decade highlighting the importance of farming, food, and storytelling in the communities of color. Her book, The Color of Food, Stories of Race, Resilience, and Farming, features stories and portraits of farmers and food actress, activists from Black, Latina, Asian, and Native communities across the country. Stories that invite us to dig deep into race, culture, and equity. It's my pleasure to introduce Natasha Bowens Blair. Welcome, thanks for being on Prime Time for Women. Thank you, thank you so much for having me today. I, I'm so glad you're here. Uh, so Natasha, one of my favorite things about hosting this show is the amazing women I've uh, get to meet, and I've never before had the privilege to meet someone who's been honored by the Smithsonian Institute. <laughs> uh, you were in the Museum of African American History and Culture. Can you tell us why you were honored and a little bit about that story? Yeah, so sometimes it's still surreal for me. I bet, I bet. That's <laughs> quite an honor. I got to go and visit um, the plaque that pulled a quote from, from my book there featured. Um, and yeah, so I, I wrote The Color of Food, as mentioned, and so um, I was honored to, to have a quote from the book pulled with my name there on, on a nice big plaque. And it's actually in the, um, so the cafeteria in the Smithsonian is very famous as well for um, just honoring African American food and culture. Um, and so within the cafeteria, they have um, have a portraits and different photos and different quotes from other folks who've really, um, you know, contributed to the history of African American food and culture here in the States. And so it's quite an honor. I still. <laughs> still and is your quite book sold at the Smithsonian it. as well? Uh, you know what? That's a good question. Hopefully by now it is. Oh, good, at good. At the time, we, it wasn't in there. And so my husband made a call about every day after we went and visited and said, make sure the book is in there. Oh, that's so neat. <laughs> so uh, just before we move on to our next question, where can people get the book? Um, right now, you can purchase it on Amazon or at a local bookstore, the Curious Iguana in Frederick, my home town um, also sells it and then um, I will be selling more on my site as well I used to back when I was traveling for the book and kind of took a break to have some babies okay <laughs> I gather from my research that you're the first uh, and for at the first and foremost you're a wife and mother and then a farmer that sounds like the priority yes. could you please talk about uh, the different aspects of these how these parts of your life intersect yeah, so, um, well, you know, I wrote the book and started farming well before I had kids, but I think, um, you know, the importance of, you know, where the food came from and what I was putting in my body, it was important to me at a time before becoming a mom, but as soon as I became a mom, it was just all the more important. Um, and, um, you know, my kids are a part of the farm with me. They come up to the farm at Thursdays. Today is usually our farm day, and they'll be up helping me pick blueberries or picking flowers or playing with Nana, who is my co-owner. How old are your daughters now? Uh, four and two and a half. Oh, that's so cool. Mm -hmm. um, I love the part on your website, especially the part about where you and Julie first uh, became family and mm -hmm. then became business partners. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, I guess it's the love story that connects these generations, three generations. Yeah, so Julie and her late husband, Billy Ware, um, found the land back in the early 80s and uh, decided they wanted to start their family there and they built the house that is there now and um, 
you know, they, they had my husband, Crosby, and his sister, and they ran around picking blueberries and climbing trees. And, um, you know, I met my husband. I was farming here in the area in Shepherdstown, and he was working for the same farmer. Um, he's a teacher, but he was kind of doing a summer job. And we fell in love, and as soon as I stepped foot on the land, I just knew it was a special place. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got married there under the black walnut tree, and now our kids run around climbing trees and oh, picking that must blueberries. Be so fun. <laughs> I bet that's just special. a thrill for your husband. Yeah, and for Julie. I think she really gets misty-eyed when we're all there at Christmas time. Oh, and that's neat. That's <laughs> neat. So on your uh, website, you say, uh, you, uh, there's a quote that says, we are a biracial family farm, proud to be stewarding the land and working to support our community with the joy of flowers and healing powers of plants. Uh, what, uh, in, in your mission statement, you address race and the importance of organic farming. That's a lot of passion. What advice do you have to others who are looking to find fulfilling and meaningful work like you have found? Um, I think for me, I've just kind of followed that voice inside. You know, we might call it intuition, call it what you will. Maybe some religious folks might call it something else. But I think just really listening to that and following your passion. I'm, it's not always easy, right, to kind of leave the safety of your day to day to go after what you're really passionate about. But I did that from the beginning. My family thought I was crazy when I moved into a station wagon to drive around the country and interview these folks. But that's kind of the path I've always taken. And it's, it's let me. Here. and it's working for you. Yeah. Natasha is such an inspiration. There's so much more for us to learn from her. Don't go away. We'll be right back after this short commercial break. 14 years ago, he diagnosed her with cystic fibrosis. Our doctors read charts and test results. Knowing my family history, she screened me early for colon cancer. They read medical journals and digital images. But the most important thing they read he put down the laptop, he looked me in the eye, and listened. Are there patients? Meritus Medical Group, home to your extraordinary doctor. The DVR, it's changed the way we watch TV. And now, Antietam Broadband takes you to the next level with TiVo. Find your favorites on cable or streaming video faster with voice-activated integrated search. Record up to six channels at once and watch from any TV in your home. TiVo from Antietam Broadband. It will change your life. Call today or visit AntietamBroadband.com to learn more. Welcome back. But today we're here with Natasha Bowens Blair, who is sharing her story and passion for her work at Native Mountain Farm, which she describes as a female owned, black empowered business. I'm so glad that we're getting to finally talk. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Natasha, uh, before the commercial, we were talking about the farm being founded on and sustained by love. Not only that, you continue to empower love by providing flowers and uh, what for weddings and baby showers. Uh, can your farm also be used as a wedding venue? Is it? We hope to one day, but right now we're not set up for that. But we okay. hope to be able to be a venue and also a workshop space. Um, okay. That's one way that a lot of people use our flowers is we have um, these sip and stem workshops where you can learn about floral arranging or dried flower arranging and wreath making. While you're sipping wine, right? While you're sipping wine. Yeah, that, we that, have one coming up at Big Cork. This okay, month. that's great. <laughs> and uh, I just wanted to thank you for bringing those lovely yeah. flowers from your farm. They're of beautiful. Course. Thank you for bringing them to the set today. Okay. Uh, you currently commute from Frederick to uh, your farm, mm -hmm. I, I mean from Frederick to Boonesboro. Yes. Um, before I ask you about uh, that, um, how, how does it work for you uh, to be at the farm and then have to go home and I guess get kids and, or yeah, tell us a little bit about that. Well, as women, we know we wear many hats and right. we just have to kind of seamlessly change in and out of them. So I wake up very early, about 5.30, drive the 25 minutes to the farm, harvest as quickly as I can or do whatever jobs I have to do on the farm. And then as soon as I'm walking in the door, it's mommy, mommy, pick up the kids, make breakfast, and then okay. go about our day, so. 
So, and at the farm, you are growing flowers, medicinal herbs, yes. and uh, and some fruit. We and have some fruit. Um, elderberry, okay. which we also use uh, medicinally, and then blueberries, or the first berry on the farm, as well as figs, blackberries, raspberries. Okay. Uh, tell us a little bit about your book and maybe hold that up. Let me yeah. see that. Yeah. So here's the color of food with some beautiful portraits on the front um, of some of the farmers that I interviewed. Um, so this book contains portraits and stories from, well, I interviewed over 75 farmers of color around the country. Mm -hmm. um, and I was able to travel around and I stayed with some of the farmers or stayed near them. And I would spend either a couple days or an entire day just, um, you know, sitting at their feet and soaking in their story and soaking in their knowledge and wisdom about farming or about um, you know their family history on the land and any obstacles or issues as a person of color in the agricultural industry that they'd experienced. Which is still a pretty small percentage overall in our country. Um, what is it that you hope um, the readers, what's the most important takeaway? What do you hope readers take away from reading this book? Well, I think you know we think about farmers or we see kind of um, the way farmers are spoken about or, or shown and it's just you know kind of the John Deere farmer on his tractor and I think this book the, the big takeaway is to know that that is not the only story in farming and in agriculture we have um, old native grandmothers that have been tilling this land for longer than we've all been here and we have black farmers that have been fighting to hold on to their land um, for decades and decades and just to know that there are other stories right there in our seeds, in our food, and in this soil that we walk on. Yeah, that's important. Uh, so when I think about Prime Time for Women, one of the things that we talk about is the power of the stories that we tell ourselves, how those stories shape us. I was wondering if you have a story either from your book that you would like to share or something you tell yourself that uh, enables you to sh uh, share your passion. What is the story you tell yourself? Well, I feel like the story that keeps me going, you know, we all have those days where we wake up and we wonder if what we're doing is, you know, we're working so hard and what keeps us going, what keeps me going is definitely working with the plants and knowing that I belong there on the land. The minute that I dug my fingers into the soil, I felt a connection with something bigger than myself, um, not just with you know the earth and the plants, but I, I think with my ancestors. And uh, just to know that as a woman who is growing plants and using them to heal and nourish myself and my family, and then sharing that with my community, um, that's a story that I think is very powerful for my daughters to pick up and, and learn, and, and, um, and for the rest of the community of, of women and folks of color who who might feel like this isn't a place for them might not even think of it as an option it's right. providing space for people to say huh I get to consider that right or it, maybe they maybe not everyone wants to be a farmer but to know that when we're going and we're you know we're, we're taking our medicine or we're eating our food to really uh, remember that um, you know we're connected with that that's great and uh, I was just going to ask what do your girls say about the farm Oh, they love it. They say, Mommy, you know. Do they consider <laughs> Are you going themselves to... little farmers? Oh, 100%. They, they'll sit here and arrange in the jars with the flowers, That's and great. they'll pick the blueberries and eat the elderberries right off the bush. And... That's great. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being on our show. Thank you for having I'd me. like to thank uh, Natasha for being here and on Primetime for Women. Uh, your commitment to the land, your passion for justice and equality, and your desire to build community are so inspiring. If, like me, you are an all of this powerful woman, then support her farm and remember to speak your truth. Together is how we can make a difference. Stay tuned, we'll be right back with our next guest. 14 years ago, he diagnosed her with cystic fibrosis. Our doctors read charts and test results. Knowing my family history, she screened me early for colon cancer. They read medical journals and digital images. But the most important thing they read. He put down the laptop, he looked me in the eye, and listened. Are there patients? Meritus Medical Group, home to your extraordinary doctor. The DVR, it's changed the way we watch TV. And now, Antietam Broadband takes you to the next level with TiVo. Find your favorites on cable or streaming video faster with voice activated integrated search. Record up to six channels at once and watch from any TV in your home. TiVo from Antietam Broadband. 
it will change your life. Call today or visit AntietamBroadband.com to learn more. Our next guest enjoys doing puzzles. And all I have to say about that is it's a darn good thing. Kay Rabucci, as the director of Washington County's Board of Election, has to fit a myriad of pieces together to prepare and conduct all primary, general, and special elections held in Washington County. She oversees a staff that processes, evaluates, and reports election results, recruits and trains precinct election officials, and maintains the voter registration records. And that's just some of her many duties. Kay, who earned a bachelor's degree in business administration from Shippensburg University, first became involved with the elections in 1988 while serving as an election judge. She joined the Washington County Board of Election full-time in 1992 as an election registrar and worked her way up the career ladder. She became the deputy director in 1995 and was appointed election director in 2010. Kay has witnessed many changes to the voting process and has worked hard to ensure the fair, impartial voting process demanded by our democracy. She joins us today to provide a little historical perspective and to discuss the challenges faced by our country as we conduct elections during the first ever pandemic. Welcome, Kay. Thanks for being here. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Sure. So, Kay, in 2003, you were designated as a certified election registrar administrator, which I did a little research, is one of the highest professional achievements possible. This recognition, for me, instills tons of confidence in our local election process. What did it mean to you to receive that uh, recognition? Well, that was the first time that there really was a designation offered for election officials. And mm -hmm. so uh, the state of Maryland uh, really worked to get the election center to provide and offer uh, the required classes so we could begin taking them. Right. And, and that was the summer of 2001, I think. They were in Annapolis and quite a few um, election officials across the state uh, were able to go and it was fascinating because it's election officials from other states and ones who have gone overseas to other countries and helped with elections and we did a lot of group uh, interaction and just hearing how different states some were already doing early voting um, provisional voting and just being able to learn and get some information from them was just so interesting and exciting. Oh, that's great. That's great. And you brought it all back to us. So that's great. Uh, yes. <laughs> and it just helped. And now we have uh, additional staff members starting to take the classes and working towards their certification. That's neat. So you've been doing uh, election work for 28 years. Uh, over the course of that time, you've seen a lot of changes. Uh, can you talk about maybe the one that was the most difficult to implement? Besides this election? Yeah, uh, okay. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess that's what I was thinking. Um, yes, we have seen a lot of changes. And uh, I think one that really would have affected all the, the voters is probably when we went from our lever machine voting system that we'd had for 30 years. Right, And right. Uh, they were still using it when I came on board. And we went to a paper-based voting system with uh, scanners to feed your ballot into, kind of like what we have now, but this was back in 1994. Was that with the hanging chads? No, we never had the um, butterfly ballots or oh, whatever. Okay. Yeah, we had went from lever machines to, it was called the um, 3P Eagle, okay. and it was a paper ballot system. And just trying to get that new uh, way of voting across to the voters, was interesting what we had as far as media outlets at the time, you know, before social media, and we really kind of just took it on the road. So was there one change that really uh, increased voter engagement and participation that you can look to? I think that one to me is offering early voting. Okay. I love early voting. I just enjoy, and it's when you have an opportunity before election day uh, to go vote. Uh, Washington County just has the one site, uh, but eight days you can go and so many people bring their parents, you know, on the weekends when it's a little slower. And I just, uh, it's so enjoyable to see people come out and participate uh, with early voting. And when did early voting start? Early voting started in 2010. Okay. 
Well, thank you for sharing a little bit of history with us. We're going to take a quick commercial break, and when we come back, you can fill us in on what's going on today, some of our uh, voting processes, and also our challenges and our successes. Okay. Don't go away. We'll be right back after this commercial break. Fourteen years ago, he diagnosed her with cystic fibrosis. Our doctors read charts and test results. Knowing my family history, she screened me early for colon cancer. They read medical journals and digital images. But the most important thing they read... He put down the laptop, he looked me in the eye, and listened. ...are their patients. Meritus Medical Group, home to your extraordinary doctor. Prior to the commercial, Kay Rabusi, the director of the Washington County Board of Education, was telling us w about her work and some of the past uh, implementations of different processes in the voting and changes during the voting law. Now she's going to tell us about some of the challenges that our officials are facing, both locally and nationally. Um, before we get to that, though, Kay, you brought um, a document with you. I was wondering if you would talk a little bit about that today. Uh, sure. I found that uh, when I was going through some things, our previous um, election director, a couple years back, Jean Calhoun, always kept newspaper clippings and everything. And I found that and I thought we really should frame that. And it's, it's from 1919. 1919. It's, it looks to me to be um, sample ballot information that they would have had in the newspaper. And what I like about it is 1919 was before women had the right, right to, to vote. vote. And so, uh, and since we're celebrating the 100 year anniversary of that, I thought I'm going to bring that along to show Bernadette. I'm so glad you did. And it, it's interesting because it lists the polling places at the time um, that were used. I'm happy to say we're not still using any of those same places, uh, but it's just a <laughs> really neat it. piece of uh, history that uh, we will keep. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. Well, you're welcome. So, um, Kay, I know you wouldn't be doing this work if you personally weren't really um, passionate about civic engagement and specifically about people's right, exercising their right to vote. So can you tell us what the election board does to encourage civic participation and voting? Uh, the election board, um, of course, is getting the information out to the voters letting them know the different deadlines that are coming up. Uh, we think the best way for people to really understand what's going on is if they would be an election worker. Mm -hmm. That's one of the task, uh, jobs that we offer. And we use uh, around 700 workers on election day during a normal election and provide training. But that is such a unique way to get to see what is going on in the election office because a lot of times people think we only work twice a year every other year and uh, we also <laughs> offer voter registration volunteers and they can come in and get training and then go out and do voter registration drives and that has really been popular this year also and that again helps others to see what is involved, what's required, and it helps us also because we just can't do it all ourselves. Great. Um, and so we offer election judges and volunteer voter um, registration and volunteers. You spend a lot of time trying to educate the public about their right to vote and where to vote. And all yes, that we stuff do, too. and it's been. Yes, and we try to use different um, mediums to get that across. And, and I was more. going to say that one of the things that has been a problem, uh, depending on who you talk to, social media has either been a boon for some people say, oh, it's great because it allows candidates to talk directly to their people, their supporters, and other people say, no, social media is putting out uh, inaccurate information. But the election board uses it to uh, educate people. Yes, uh, educate and inform. It's a wonderful way to... Um, pass along such important information. And so uh, I have several people in the office responsible for our website, which if you're looking for the most current information would be there. 
deadlines, uh, how to go about getting a mail-in ballot, and then also our Facebook. And so, yes, for us, it has been a wonderful way to get the information out. So we're in the middle of this pandemic. Uh, can you tell us uh, how has that impacted the election process? I know recruiting judges has been difficult. Well, anything else? Just the whole um, social distancing has become something we really have to think about as we are designing, laying out the polling uh, places or the vote centers that we're gonna have and just keeping that in mind along with not just protecting um, the voters, but also the election judges, uh, my staff and board members. Uh, and the state has been really good about getting us PPE supplies. And so we will have that available for our workers and masks for the voters if they need them. So I know that in this day and age, uh, because of the pandemic and also uh, to protect, especially at risk groups like uh, the elderly, uh, voting in person can present some problems, mm -hmm. but there are some alternative ways that people can vote. And I would yes. really want you to talk a little bit about those. Yes, thank you. Um, in this election, um, what is going to happen um, is the governor decided to have a vote by mail application request sent to everyone, so different from the primary. So by the end of August, all eligible voters should receive an application in the mail asking, do you want to request a vote by mail? Do you want the ballot sent right to you? And it's up to them whether they want to sign it and send it back. If they don't want to go to the polling places for whatever reason, I would certainly encourage them to go ahead and do that. Allow plenty of time, don't wait to the last minute but also to know once they sign that application and send it back, we are going to mail a ballot to them. If they get a ballot can they, and don't use it, can they vote at the, at the voting Excellent center? Excellent question. Once we issue a ballot, okay, we've gotten the application back, now we're gonna send a ballot. Once that is done and they show up on election day, they'll be allowed to vote, but it's gonna be a provisional ballot. Okay. Because we just have to make sure that they hadn't already voted their original ballot and sent that back. So there's so much more I want to ask you, but we're just running out of time. But real quickly, do you have confidence in the post office ability to um, handle the, ma the increased number of mail-in ballots? I do. We've used the post office for years, and I understand this is a different type of election, but I do feel confident they have never, we've never had an issue with them, you know, in Washington County. I know uh, some of the people there and they're always very helpful. And again, we know this is a different year, a different election. I just would encourage people to allow enough time to uh, return their application or their ballot. And then to also know, you know, they could go to one of the vote centers on election day and okay. also vote in person. And I just want to make a clarification that a vote center is different than a polling place because you can go to any vote center. You don't have to be in your precinct. That is exactly right. We're going to have 11 places on a November 3rd, and you can go to whichever one's most convenient, and you'll be hearing that information from us as time goes on. Well, Kay, I thank you for being here. And I just want to tell our viewers that if you have more information, check out their website. Uh, it's a wealth of information. You can't go wrong. Also, know that you can call them. Yes. I'd like to thank you for being here today on our program. Remember, voting is a privilege, but it's also an incredible responsibility. Kay, probably more than most people, understands the importance of these words that were spoken by Louis Brandeis. He said, the most important office and the one which all of us can and should fill is that of private citizen. I encourage all of you to flex your electoral muscles and be sure to cast your vote, either by mail, early voting, or at the, at the vote centers on election day. It doesn't matter how you, uh, how you vote, but it definitely matters if you vote. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time on Primetime for Women.